be that I'm drinking an old fashioned right now. <laughs> We'll start on that. <laughs> What's up, dude? Hi. <laughs> we have my boy Ryan Brophy in the house. Mm-hmm. The one and only. How's it going, my friend? It's going great. How's your day? My day is, has been refreshingly very simple. Yeah, day off, man. Yeah, yeah. Much hey, needed. So, the old, you're from Sugarland, Texas, correct? Yep. Mm-hmm. I've only heard about Sugarland because I used to follow this guy on YouTube mm-hmm. called Christian, Christian Guzman. Have you heard of him? Yeah. I think I went to high school with him. Oh, you're lying. No, I'm serious. He's like the owner of Alphalete. How old is he? I don't know. He's probably 28. Yeah, I think he went to my high school. I think he went to Clements. I'm not 100% sure, but that as soon as you said that name, I was like, yep. I'll have to double check. He basically dropped out of like college and he started this brand called Alphalete. Have you heard of it? Mm-mm. Yeah, so he, he, he started this whole gym in uh texas it's like 20 acres or something no like way that. it's and i want to go check it out it's yeah. insane sugarland's a crazy place yeah what, what's it like it's just very in texas versus like la it's so i mean houston to start houston and la are very similar geographically okay it's houston you didn't grow up in houston though right? so sugarland is a suburb of houston it's okay, on the so southwest it's side so yeah it's, close. Okay. it's about like it's crazy because our highways are like 12 14 lanes or whatever so like it wait, takes wait, wait, wait. so like over here on the freeway there's like five mm-hmm. there's 14 lanes on a freeway yeah there's like seven going one direction seven going the other like it's just massive that's huge so i mean there's more space obviously for more cars and more yeah. traffic volume so and it there's takes a lot less people there yeah Houston, like sugarland from downtown houston is about the same distance as maybe downtown la is from like thousand oaks okay i would say but it takes like half the amount of time to drive from sugarland to houston that it does from la to thousand oaks okay just because we can handle our shit better yeah but it's it's like you the sprawl is crazy in houston yeah sprawl but sprawl sprawl. just like it's flat it's wide yeah there's a thousand also sorry move the microphone to your chin so people can see your face oh yeah here we go hi people um, there's just like a, a thousand different little towns that each have their own little identity and it's yeah. all flat and like spread out and mm-hmm. you keep driving and you're like still in Fort Bend County or you're still in Harris County, which is all Houston. Yeah. And it's just like crazy. It's, it's the fourth biggest city, fourth most populous city in the nation. Would you ever go back? California's kind of crazy right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go back to Texas. I mean, oh, well, the thing about Houston is that there's like a lot of fine dining out there. Like okay. I have like a coworker, Michelin at, star type fine dining. I don't know about that, mm-hmm. but just like tons of different, like different and diverse and like upscale places. It's it's very underrated. I heard the food's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's this one guy who started a restaurant out here uh, that it's called Sushi Kitchen or something like that. Well, it's basically like there's only twelve seats, mm-hmm. right? And you reserve it. And you go in and it's only like, it's chef's choice. Yeah. And he just didn't, he started it here and then he moved to Texas Mm -hmm. and he got his first Michelin star Mm -hmm. and it's, uh, he has like an Italian place and a sushi place. The concept's kind of crazy because we both work in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. And like, we I've, i haven't heard of that yeah it's where like you can't even choose what you they want. release the books like the first monday of the month or something yeah. and you have to like time it so that you get a reservation yeah because it's like only 12 seats yeah, yeah. that's have, crazy have, have you been to a michelin star restaurant before or? yeah so my boyfriend's birthday this past year we went to providence okay. which is on melrose yeah um and it was insane i mean it was like 13 courses 225 per per head without the wine pairing um and it was like uni egg and like i had like a duck liver pate and like everybody else had like a5 wagyu beef but everything else was a prefix but um how is it it, how is it if you for like the people who haven't been to a uh, michelin star restaurant mm -hmm. like how would you describe it it's just like you sit down and like the waiter comes up and takes your drink order and everything and just kind of like normal service normal service but then like there's also a team of people that just like silently descend upon the table from course to course. Mm -hmm. And like, 
you you start a conversation with the person across from you and then you look down and your plate's gone and then the next second you look down and you're completely reset again like it's just like seamless and what, was it a good experience did you like love it yeah yeah it like, was amazing recommend it if, if someone could afford it to go yeah if well, at least can, a couple times if you a... can afford to splurge it's an experience oh god i can't wait until the next one whenever <laughs> it is but there's nothing really like that in houston okay. but there's like a lot of you know steakhouses and yeah. like really nice like tex-mex places like mm -hmm. upscale like mexican eateries and stuff i have a coworker at firefly who raised four kids just working in fine dining in houston for like 25 years and then he moved out to la like a couple years ago lives on the west side you know knew somebody involved at firefly so he's been there for like a year yo there's uh so much money in the service industry that like it's kind of like not touched a lot it's kind of looked down upon sometimes mm -hmm. but like i think what was it i think la restaurants provide 70 percent of like employment hmm. i read that stat somewhere not surprised yeah like <laughs> insane yeah like there's so many food spots and everyone eats yeah like it's gonna be there did you see the list of the 101 best restaurants that the la times posted no yeah i went through it a couple weeks ago and made a list of everything that i wanted to try and is there any restaurants that like we know that are like on there uh bestia Bestia's and Bavel, on there. okay duh um i've I never been to bestia yet providence was on there you have to go to bestia if you're like cool about being a little bit claustrophobic yeah. just because like it, they pack people in yeah um it's incredible so i i'm opening up lava right right and uh they poached bestia's head chef really Oh yeah, that guy. It's like a husband and wife team or something. Um, I don't, I don't know. But, but Bestia like... and Bavel are sister restaurants. Okay. And I think both of them. I forget their names, but I think they're a husband and wife duo. Um, or maybe they're just like. I think the... it's just a guy. Okay. Yeah, I could be wrong. Yeah. But um, when we were doing like food uh, knowledge that day, and the chef was going over it, um, they were like, "Oh yeah, the head kitchen chef is." straight from bestia he knows what he's doing if you guys know what bestia is it's like one of the best restaurants mm -hmm. in la mm -hmm. yeah do you know what michelin do, do you know i just found this out the other day do you know the meaning behind like michelin stars it's like the tire guide magazine right yeah but they just have a subsection for restaurants similar but basically like a one michelin star is like i'm gonna make the trek to the drive mm -hmm. to go like get this nice food yeah each star that's higher is basically like a, a three stars base basically like you're going to a basically a vacation yeah just to this place like it's that quality Damn. that you would like take a week and travel yeah. and drive or like whatever yeah for that caliber of like food yeah providence has two that's I pretty think. solid yeah so there's people probably who come from like low-key around the world yeah to uh yeah yeah there's this place called ennaka in culver city okay um it's like it's like california kaisake dining which is just it's also I have no like clue what that means 13 to 15 courses like but it's it's i think it has three and i think okay. it's the only three-star michelin restaurant in, in LA. la i think wait well, where's, the, where's the french laundry at French Laundry is in, up in Uniteville, which is in, like, Napa. Okay. So that's, like, more upstate. But, yeah, I mean, I think I'll, uh, that's it, a bucket list place for that's sure. That's a bucket list place. Everyone talks about it. Like, Did it's, you know, you it's remember, heaven. Do you remember Chelsea from yes. Soho? Yeah, she went there one time because she knew somebody that was affiliated. And, and she said it was just, just like, the insane. best thing ever. Yeah. I think she said she drank so much wine that she, like, fell off her bike <laughs> while she was leaving and then, like, hurt herself pretty bad. Um, but she's fine now. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, what brought you to L.A., my friend? I went to USC. Okay, I, is that is that why you moved to L.A.? Yeah, I knew I wanted to um, go to a coast because okay. like, I was in the middle of the country. I was yeah. on the Gulf Coast, but yeah. there was nothing happening there. So I wanted to do East or West Coast or Northwestern Okay. Um, because I did a summer program at Northwestern uh, summer before my senior year of high school. Sweet. It's like a drama program and okay. it sort of like mimics what it's like to be in a college conservatory mm. program, which what, is where you like... What's a conservatory? Conservatory is uh, like when people say that they got like a BFA in uh -huh. acting, that's usually what they mean. It's like rigorous 
nine to five mm -hmm. coursework in acting, scene study, movement, mm -hmm. voice, like a traditional BFA is like two thirds of your coursework to get your degree mm -hmm. is involved in your major. Yeah. Whereas with a BA, it's usually just one third and then the rest is filled with like GEs and so like BFA other requirements. is mostly like it's main focus is acting. Yeah. So it's for example, like Juilliard yeah. is a conservatory. Okay. And like DePaul and CCM and NYU and okay. all these other places are conservatories. And USC. And USC has a BFA, but they're unique in that they also have a BA program. Okay. Um, a lot of places, it's really one or the other. Okay. Um, so I I did that program, and I was like, a BFA could be good for me. Like, I really enjoy being immersed, mm -hmm. but it was sort of a compromise that I reached with my parents. Yeah. Like, they didn't want me to just go all in quite yet. Mm -hmm. um, did you always want to get into acting? Like, when you were in, like, elementary school, were you yeah. in plays? Like No question. Yeah. What, what what drew you to that you think i don't know man like truly it like just... were you watching tv as a young kid just like trying to imitate like yeah really? like lots of home videos of mm. little ryan like singing, singing. yeah and there's like a ballet recital that i did when i was two where i just oh. like hammed it up because i was like the only boy and i just decided to make like a bit out of it on stage and sure. um yeah, I don't know. It's one of those things that kind of like chose me, as dumb as that sounds. But like I, you know, growing up in Texas, you grow up in the church mm -hmm. and my mom put me in church choir when yeah. I was five or six. Christian, and, Catholic? Uh, yeah, non, uh, it was a, I was baptized in the Methodist church. Okay. So Protestant. Protestant. Irish Protestant here. Um, and yeah, they would just do like these little musicals and it was always something that I was just like natural at yeah. and something that I enjoyed and... Did you, um, at least for me, I grew up in a, like a private school too. And like, mm -hmm. I would do choir cause they forced you to do choir. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of was into some music, but I wasn't like engulfed in it. Like for me, like choir had a, a negative connotation or like drama had a negative connotation. Really? Yeah. Or like at least, at least for me, like, hmm. and, uh, I think that could be why that I didn't lean like further into it. Like remind when, me where you grew up again, Fresno, California. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. So just a few hours north of here. Yeah. It was cool because like at least when I got to high school. So no, did you have that at all or no? Like was it? Uh, like maybe in middle school okay. kind of. Yeah. But when I got to high school, my high school was weird. It was like a very cool, like diverse, chill place to be kind uh -huh. of. And like the football players would audition for the musical in the spring and mm -hmm. they would also be in the choir. And there was just like lots of cross-pollination happening and like the popular kids were in theater but the popular kids were also jocks and there were also some popular kids that were in like deca or like oh, you no know way. the business club or sure. whatever so it was just like my high school was a place where I, and i feel very lucky yeah. in that sense that it was kind of an oasis where i ended up sounds but, like a dope high school yeah it was <laughs> it, it was i mean there were a lot of people there and it was really really competitive but yeah. um yeah, it was basically a place where you could just do whatever you wanted to do and people respected it and it wasn't like clicky or anything. That's so awesome. so that was cool. But nice. yeah, I I wanted to go to New York or Chicago or LA, LA. and USC. What, what just, was your uh yeah, what was your I guess final determinant to uh go to USC? So they offered me the most money. Oh nice. <laughs> That's always a good factor. Yeah, I was uh I I was a National Merit Scholar. Well, what does that mean? It means I got a really good PSAT score oh, and nice. a really good SAT score. It's so, dumb. But smart, smart guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they offered me half tuition. And oh, they, nice. Yeah. And my dad was like prepared to match it. So oh, cool. it was just going to be a situation where I wouldn't have to worry about loans or anything. Yeah. And it was in LA. All right. Tell me, tell me something. Um, why would someone benefit from going to an elite college for acting? Um, for USC, at least, it's the network. Okay. Um, I'm going to be real and say that, like, when I was at USC, the coursework and, like, the faculty and, and kind of, like, the quality of the productions that we would put on was a little bit all over the place. So like the sure. training that I had gotten from that summer program or that I would have gotten at a BFA yeah. was maybe a little bit lacking, Yeah, but 
you're right next to the best film school in the country and you're in class with some of these best people. Best film school is USC. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's uh, the best film school in the country. Yeah. Okay. Usually. It's usually on like those ho- like the Hollywood Reporter list or sure. whatever. Um so it's very you it's interdisciplinary and yeah. it's also like if you're in the BA, you have a lot of leverage to like be in a play one semester and then just focus on student films the next semester. Yeah. And it kind of teaches you um just how to form relationships and how to connect and how to just be open to things. Yeah. Um I have a lot a lot a lot of people I know who went to USC and got so much from the networking. And yeah. they say it all the That's time. That's what you're paying for. Yeah, like uh one of my main personal training clients, he's a head agent at UTA mm-hmm. and he's got his first job just because he went to USC. They're yeah. like, Oh, go work mm-hmm. there. That's how I got my first internship. Yeah. I got my first yeah. development internship summer after my freshman year at mm-hmm. Voltage Pictures. Cool. Which is known for doing the Hurt Locker. That's the thing that like put them on the map. What's the Hurt Locker? It's a movie that won Best Picture in two thousand nine. Oh, okay. Voltage Locker? The Volt- <laughs> Voltage Pictures. Oh, Voltage Pictures. <laughs> the Hurt the Locker. Hurt locker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah what's um, it like being an intern for one of those things is it like as shitty as so for that said? one it was it was my first one so yeah. it was grunt work it was script coverage which is you get a submission and you cover okay. it which means you basically just like write a three to five page summary of everything that happens in the script mm-hmm. and then you evaluate it which is like one to two pages and then ultimately it ends in like your recommendation should we pass on it should we consider it oh you had to do that right away yeah so you didn't have to do like coffees and stuff like well, that? Well, you were also having to oh, do that okay. stuff. And it was also unpaid. So Oh. Yeah. You get college oh. credit. So you're paying to be there. Okay. But that was the most grunt worky of the internships mm-hmm. that I did. I also worked at Showtime the summer after that, Showtime Networks. Okay. How was that? That was good. I, I was doing uh I was in the acquisitions department, mm-hmm. which basically meant that I just got to watch movies all day and like evaluate them and sure. be like because Showtime has like their main network, but they also have like subsidiary networks where they air Mm -hmm. like indie movies or like vintage horror movies or like festival circuit things that aren't necessarily going to be broadcast on a wider scale sure so i got to just watch those and what what's the biggest thing that you learned from these internships oh man well they were also different i i think like for example with showtime another really cool component that we got to do in addition to like our daily duties was they gave us this like sample project basically Uh there was a new original series that was premiering that summer at showtime yeah and we had to build we had there were four of us in the la office and the four interns had to come up with an entire marketing campaign aimed Mm -hmm. specifically at the college demographic because the show was a show about music. It was, a sh- it was called Roadies. It mm-hmm. only lasted one season. RIP. But um, it, was, it was about like music and being on the road and like finding yourself on the road. And like there was basically like a band of the week that would make a cameo in every episode. Okay. And they would, there was like a song cool per concept. episode. Or whatever. Cool yeah. concept. So we had to figure out a way to like market that to like a college audience. And we had to talk about like partnerships. Mm-hmm. And it was all like hypothetical. Yeah. But like executives would fly in for our presentation like the chairman of the company mm. was there that's and a good experience yeah, great experience yeah and then like with the with development i just kind of like you know you get hands-on experience of how like unpredictable everything is yeah. and how like a script can get dashed like it can be going really well and then it can dashed. get canned for whatever reason dashed. or just like dashed mean? put like on the back burner uh, okay um yeah, and interacting with executives and taking phone calls, like that kind of stuff is just like, you know, th- that's, that's like, what that one was good for. That's very like, you're learning a lot about the whole industry. Yeah, and then Showtime was yeah. sort of like a, a logical next step. And then the summer after that, I went to New York and I interned at the Telsey office, which is a major, major casting office. Sweet. Um, they do pretty much everything on Broadway. Like they do, they did Wicked, they did Rent, like the original Rent in the nineties. Um, they were doing Come From Away, which was a a Tony winning musical that summer. Mm -hmm. Um, they do, they do TV and movies like they did This Is Us. They do, um, all kinds of stuff. So as an actor, that Mm -hmm. one was really exciting for me because I got to be in the room. I got to record auditions. I got to be a reader. And then also the thing that was probably of the most value just in terms of like my longevity in this profession sure 
when you don't have anything else to do in that office as an intern, you do what's called days done, mm -hmm. which is where you literally go through all of the headshots of all of the actors that they have passed on. Pass, like no, no go. No callback. Okay. They came in. Good to see you. We're not considering you for this. Okay. And you just hole punch their headshots and file them in alphabetical order and you put them in a binder and there's like 40 binders full of just like act. it's like an why actor database the most What's the, why is that the most value to you because it just goes to show that like they can randomly pull a binder out and sift through the people that they've seen already and be reminded of the work that you did and mm -hmm. even if you weren't right for that one specific project you might be right for something oh, so else they still hold of. on to them yeah yeah okay. you're in their database mm -hmm. you know like they've seen your work they've seen you before casting directors are looking for opportunities for mm. you even if you think it's the other way around like even if you go into the room and think that maybe like oh i'm wasting their time i'm not sure. right for this whatever they they're on your side like they want to employ mm. you they want you to get the job a lot of people don't think that yeah and a lot of people would get intimidated by that and see all the rejections and be like mm, i don't know if yeah. this is what i'm signing up for yeah. i am not super down but i did that and i was like fascinated by it that's awesome and then, yeah. I so went. a lot of people think like the barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got your entrance because of UFC. Yeah. UFC, right? Mm -hmm. And these connections and you got these internships. Mm -hmm. And there's like actors who move from all around the world, mm -hmm. come to LA, mm -hmm. and they're like, where the fuck do I start? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I guess that's the a benefit of going to a school that allows you to network and it's the biggest film school in like basically the United States. Mm -hmm. But they do have a good theater program too. It was kind of like being worked on while I was there, which uh -huh. was just like unfortunate timing, but it's to my knowledge, it's really improved and they've beefed up their faculty and it, nice. Yeah. So how does like one actor come from, um, not a school mm -hmm. move to LA? How mm -hmm. do they get into this? Like, world like is how do they get the internship without the connection i would i don't know like <laughs> <laughs> go to usc folks <laughs> yeah exactly it's so but there's so many like moving parts and there's so many factors and like i just i i would tell like if, if i i were in the position to yeah. give advice yeah. i just find a good class like a good reputable acting class not like egotistical mm -hmm. teacher who wants to collaborate and who wants to help you and who teaches like healthy technique and a healthy process. Um, and you know, you see these people, your, your classmates, like 10 or 15 people that mm. you just come in and, and work with once a week. Yeah. That's for me, that's the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I still do that to this day, every Monday night, like I'm in class and I have whatever opportunities I have throughout the rest of the week. And yeah. I have, you know, I have my day job and, sure all the other stuff that I'm doing, but the core of my practice is like this Monday night class. So on these Monday night acting classes, mm -hmm. what, what do you practice? Um, some would call it scene study, mm -hmm. which is the technical term for when you are working on a conversation from a play or from a movie or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you have a scene partner who you're doing that scene with yes yeah um some teachers will have you rehearse throughout the week outside of class my teacher does not do that um which i actually think is very healthy because if you're on a set mm -hmm. and you have to come into work and you have to shoot the scene that day you may not have time to rehearse or sure. if you're getting called in for an audition or a callback or something and you get the sides or the scene like the night before yeah it's on you as an actor to use your imagination and create the world and yeah. absorb the conversation and do the heart work and get yourself to that place where you're able to just play. Mm -hmm. So that's what he mimics. And that's what I have found super healthy about this class. And but yeah, you come in and you work every week and you, you do your conversation, you do your scene. Um, and then he just talks to each of you and you have your recall, which is, does it feel competitive at all? No. No. In some classes, it does. Okay. Because some people are only there to network and they don't really care about the craft yeah. or whatever. 
Uh, I, in my head, if I'm going into this like room full of actors who are mm-hmm. practicing the same thing, who are trying to get the same type of gigs, I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm trying to scope out my competition, blah, blah, blah. It's I mean, easy. that's just like, I, I mean, I've never, I, I can't empathize with it because mm-hmm. I've never done it. Yeah. But that's just how like that kind of plays out in my head. It's, it's like, it's easy to fall into that and it's mm-hmm. easy to like find teachers who sort of like stoke that level of competition Mm -hmm. in the people in the like the people that are in class um but like i've just been lucky in that i found this guy and it's really it's not about any of that Mm -hmm. you know because it's like you're living a creative life yeah and you you're doing it because it's a really noble pursuit and a way to spend your life so like if you're really passionate about it and if you put the work in and if you care about doing it because it makes you feel good and it's a form of service and it's a form of storytelling, then all of the other things and everything else that's met meant for you will fall into place. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that she talks about a lot in big magic. So it's really, it's really magic's this book that he wants me to read. And I heard it's really good. (laughs) Yeah. It's a book about like, uh, living creatively beyond fear and beyond sort of the external factors. Yeah. It's weird. I love, so I, I, I realized why, like I love LA and it's because like so many people do a lot of creative things Mm -hmm. that is not even like looked down upon at all. Like, Mm -hmm. um, like if I record, I gave an example to my friend the other day. Mm-hmm. But if I record myself like working out mm-hmm. and like filming at my home gym or whatever, mm-hmm. you, there's negative connotation. Out here, it's normal. Out here, you see people like filming all the time. You see out here, yeah, people people just creating. Yeah, and it's I love it. It's yeah. awesome. There's no negative connotation at all. Maybe slightly if you're like with like a group of people who aren't in the creative world and they're like, I'm an actor or yeah. I'm a whatever. And they're like, Oh, how's that working out? Yeah. <laughs> well, if you think about it as like a product, like if you think about these workout videos or yeah. something as things that you're putting out in order to receive something back, sure. then it is going to feel toxic and it's going to feel weird and you're going to have that negative connotation. But yeah. if you just do it because you enjoy doing it, and you don't care if it fails or if it succeeds or whatever, then it just becomes more fun and it becomes yeah. play and it mm-hmm. becomes light and it becomes experimental and it becomes everything that it should be, yeah. you know? Where did you get the, I guess, like confidence in uh, pursuing a creative life? Because uh, it's not very common and uh, you seem super comfortable in your own skin in terms of creativity. Well, it's it's something that I've only really recently arrived at, to mm-hmm. be honest. Um, I think the pandemic had a lot to do with it. Like I had this How whole, so? well, I was away from it for so long. Like okay. before March 2020, I'd been working on stage consistently since before I even graduated. Yeah. Which was like two and a half years. Mm-hmm. Like I always had a gig to look forward to. Sure. And weirdly that put me in kind of an unhealthy mindset because it was like, okay, it's what's the next thing? Work, what's the next work, thing? What's the next work, thing? Yeah. And when all of game. that was taken away, I knew that I like my, my headspace at the start of the pandemic was so whack. Like I was just like, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people, I were. mean, I'm preaching to the choir, <laughs> yeah. but I was just like, I don't, I don't know how to compromise. Sure. Like I, I, I feel like it has to be an all or nothing thing. And right now yeah. being on stage and like doing what I love is not a possibility. So I'm just not even going to try and like fit a square peg into a round hole. Cool. So which, you just were like, you which is why I started ditched freelancing it. You ditched it for a little bit. I, I went back into hospitality after a yeah. little while. Like that's how I, I started working at Soho. And then I just found that I missed it mm-hmm. and I needed to get back into it. You missed it because you're like, I was like, this soul, is exactly so like it came from a very it. raw place. Yeah. Of as like, corny as that sounds, that's, but you no, were, it's that was true. Like, it was a hunger. I was called back to sure. it and I knew that I wanted to, like, I had a lot of like, kind of like mixed feelings about USC after graduating. Like I just didn't really like sort of the atmosphere that they cultivated and I, I kind of like distanced myself a little bit because Mm -hmm. I like didn't really feel like I got a lot of 
passion out of it. I mm-hmm. felt like I was supposed to be focusing on like the upward climbing and the momentum and all that stuff. And I was, sure. it just kind of had sucked all the joy out of it for yeah. me. And so I knew that from this place of needing to restart, I wanted to find something super healthy. Yeah. Um, that would just make me fall in love with it again. And then I was fortunate enough to find this class and like, yeah, I feel like, um, if you're so focused on growing, mm-hmm. um, you could be just stuck or get in a depressive state because you're not moving as fast as you want to yeah. in a, like the hierarchy of just like whatever you're trying to get into. Yeah. You're thinking in a linear progression yeah. and life and creativity and, everything that makes life worth living is not linear at all. Yeah. Like the universe has its own timing and yeah, I don't know. Like if you're meant to work in hospitality for a while and also be doing acting on the side, then you will do that for as long as you need. And I mean, like for me, a lot of people I've been hearing this a lot recently. So it's like, I don't want to repeat things that people have already said, but like serving is theater to an extent. How so? Well, I mean, with Soho especially, it's like, and I I do this at Firefly too, but it's like, you come in, you clock in, Mm -hmm. you put your uniform on, which is like your quote unquote costume. You, you go and set up the space. So like you're building your scenery, you're building your atmosphere, your atmosphere. Um, you do your pre-shift, which is where everybody gets together and Mm -hmm. talks about the night and like sets intentions and you're a part of an ensemble. So you have other people that are a part of your team as well that are on equal footing as you. And then the doors open and you let people in and you, and they come in and they sit down and you give them an experience Mm. and you, I mean, you know, so it's not always like this. Like I'm definitely being very sort of, I'm kind of waxing poetic about it, but like at the core, I do believe that like, in in a good place to work you're 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 telling them a story or you're at least being a part of the story of the night that these people are experiencing that's a very good viewpoint on serving because if every actor any creative person viewed it that way they Mm -hmm. would see that job as way more important it wouldn't be just waiting tables it wouldn't you know yeah and uh anytime anybody uh, says that i'm just like what do you mean wait i'm i'm like they call it serving for a reason yeah people are paying to be here sure so i'm gonna give them a good time yeah you know, uh, have you heard of uh, Miyamoto? I don't know if that's the right name. Uh, his last name is Musashi, the samurai. Mm-mm. And uh, so he's one of the greatest samurais of all time. Mm-hmm. And uh, this dude would practice painting and he would practice writing poetry mm-hmm. to be the best swordsmith. Mm-hmm. And you would ask, like, why? Yeah. And his biggest thing is, like, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. You know? how you serve is going to be if you treat it in a certain manner, it's going to be just as good Mm -hmm. as how you act. Yeah. You know, it's just gonna be just as good as like how you work out in the gym or Mm -hmm. like, uh, your effort and everything should translate all the way around. Also, it's like, you know, when, (laughs) when you're, it's Friday night Mm -hmm. and you have like 400 covers on the books and people have been waiting for like 30 or 45 minutes for a table and you're trying to do all these things at once you get into a flow yes, and your brain just shuts off and, you just and do you're it. in that yeah. current. But then you also have to, at the end of the night, for me at least, I think about like, what could I have done better? Mm-hmm. Like, where do I need to pick up slack? Like what moments? And what that's exactly in class when yeah. we talk about play and then recall. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. It's like you're, you're in the reality yeah you're having the conversation or you're like you know going about your flow or whatever it's like you're implicit and then explicit. you stop after it ends and you think back and you're like how can i adjust mm-hmm. it's the same thing yeah. like just on a bigger stage yeah exactly <laughs> it's very very practical like practice yeah how's working at soho we both worked there um <laughs> uh for a short period of time i was there for nine months i was there for I carried a, seven yep yep nine months i carried a baby to term at that place yep um but yeah i mean i had fun i think more so than most like pretty much any place i've worked that sense of ensemble that sense sure. of team like was definitely because we were all the same age everybody's creative like soho house has the reputation of attracting a lot of creative people People. um so that was cool to be a part of it was cool for me i guess to see people who i 
kind of looked up to. Mm -hmm. Like seeing, I guess, Kanye in person or Adele in person mm -hmm. or uh, what's the girl from Hannah Montana? Uh, uh, not Miley. Not Miley. Emily but... Osment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Emily Osment came in. I was like. Yeah, these random people. I used to watch you on TV all yeah. the time. Well, <laughs> and for me too, like fucking, you know. Sterling K. Brown or Coleman Domingo, like yeah. these these actors who are having career renaissances yeah. right now, who would just come in and hang out, or yeah. like Stevie Wonder sitting down at one of my tables on Mother's sure. Day, yeah. like, and nobody being aware that that was even going to happen at all, and yeah. then manager coming up to me and be like, "Oh, so Stevie Wonder is at table seven hundred four, Max Care, please." <laughs> um, <laughs> like. That that was very cool, and also just like, uh. I mean, it it was ravaged by the pandemic, mm -hmm. in the same way that a bunch of other hospitality groups and like were. corporate establishments yeah. were. And I understand that you know that's part of the reasons why everybody like at least in our sphere kind of like had the grievances. I think it all comes back to that, mm -hmm. so I can't fault them too much. I do think that like in normal times, it's a place that does really look out for its employees. This is normal times now, my friend. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. It's, we're, 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 we're coming out plus, of something. Two plus years of this shit now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Did you hear the mask mandate is uh, in LA is supposed to be lifted in April? In April? Okay. okay so uh, th there's, state, there's some light. statewide, it's like Next February week. 15th. Next week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Would you um, like some more? I would. Yes. We're just freaking straight. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. I actually asked about that at work the other day. I was like, is Febu is it February 15th? Or is and everybody was like, no. I was like, okay. Cool. State No, statewide it is. Statewide is February 15th. It, it but is. LA County is April. Uh, LA County said, fuck that. We're going to wait till April. Yes. Okay. I guess I understand that. That's kind of par for the course, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Salute, my friend. Salute. Um... Yeah. What? Uh, so. Soho. Uh, mm -hmm. What are you most excited for in your life right now, my friend? Um. I'm really excited to get back on stage. Yeah. Um. Stage like. Theater. Theater. Mm -hmm. So why why were you gravitated towards theater instead of like movies and TV shows and shit? Well, I mean. Because it's, can you explain what, what, like, I guess what the difference is or like how the acting is different? There really is none. It's the really? same work. It's just, if you're on set, there's, there's more people around you. It feels a little bit more artificial because you're having to do it over and over and over again until somebody else deems it right. And then we can move on. There's more waiting around. And then like, once you wrap it's like a couple months or even like a year or something before the product comes out. Gotcha. Whereas with theater, it's happening in the moment and there are bodies in seats watching you do it in real time. So that's the difference. That is, that is the, the fundamental difference. Yeah. Yes. But and you, you can't take takes. Like if you fuck up, you fuck up. Yes. And, and people mm -hmm. see it. But at the same, you're doing it like sometimes eight times a week so you have chances to do it over and over and over again and sure. you have that recall mm -hmm. and it's the same thing it's like at the end of the night you can be like what do i need to do tomorrow night to make this feel more truthful mm -hmm. um and uh, the only difference is that if you're on set and you're mm -hmm. shooting a scene that day you have to do that same process just like 10 times faster because you only have two or three hours to get this in the can before you can move on. Yeah. So with, with, with a play, you have the luxury of it being like the product goes up and then it keeps running because people keep coming to see it mm -hmm. for two, three months or however long it runs. Yeah. With a movie, it's like, you know, once it's finished, it's finished. And then the editor, like your performance is just left into the graces of like the editor. And then the sure. editor controls like w which takes make it into the final product. And oh, do but, they record plays too? Uh, sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, like as an actor, it doesn't change your process. Yeah. Like you approach it from the same like heart place and mm -hmm. from the same absorption of the story and all that stuff. Cool. But, um, you know, it's just like, yeah, you have to speak a little louder on stage and like, it's a little bit bigger. Whereas like with the camera, you know, the framing just sort yeah. of like puts you in a bit literally like smaller of a box. So yeah. it's, it's a little bit more, you can't get away with 
as much as you can get away with on stage because it's super super tight on you sure um but yeah i i for me it's it's all the same yeah i um have you been to the i forgot the name of the theater in westwood the geffen the geffen i worked there yeah mm-hmm. i watched i two plays there mm-hmm. the second one was with macbeth with uh jamie lannister it didn't go up it was supposed to yeah nikolai coster waldau yeah that's yeah. the actor yeah it yeah. They, it was on the bill it was it, on, it was in the season but it, the pandemic happened before i forgot yeah um, then it was the one before that i watched two plays hmm. before that one then hmm. but okay my my point was uh i i wasn't in the theater at all mm-hmm. and i didn't know what plays were mm-hmm. i didn't know <laughs> plays were a big thing yeah and i went to one of my clients got like i don't know if it's a season pass to the geffen yeah or whatever he got he got yeah. two tickets for every show mm-hmm. his wife couldn't make it he was like do you want to go see a play mm-hmm. i was like sure let's go yeah and i think we were like mid mid row mm-hmm. and i watched this play mm-hmm. and i was like yo everyone's dressed up nicely mm-hmm. they had a cocktail before mm-hmm. and they there's no phones allowed mm-hmm. everyone's fully present mm-hmm. in a live play mm-hmm. I was like, there's some beauty to that. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's not common with like this technical age to mm-hmm. put your phone down, turn it off yeah. and focus. Like even when I watch a movie, like yeah. I'm going to go on my you phone a couple times. Yeah. I will, my mind races, like mm-hmm. I will go to the kitchen. I would go take a shit, like, <laughs> whatever. Right. Yeah. I'll keep it going. Yeah. And in a play, I'm just, I'm going to stay there the entire time. I don't want to distract from yeah. the, the ambiance or everyone else's experience. Yeah. You know? So that was my first, uh, time, I guess, like outside of like high school plays or like whatever like yeah. that, that I got to experience like that live theater yeah. and well uh, i mean it's been around for thousands and thousands of years sure. for a reason i also you know? didn't think it existed anymore yeah <laughs> well that's because you're in la and people don't talk about theater in la the same way that they talk about theater in new york i mean or London they don't talk about or... theater at all in my hometown <laughs> yeah yeah in fresno, in fresno the california. booming theater scene of fresno california yeah um but no i mean yeah it's it's people having an experience, a human experience, yeah. telling a human story in front of other people who are receiving that same story. Sure. And liter- like viscerally examining themselves, hitting, being hit with like truth bombs all over the place. Like yeah. it's just, it is, a, you're right. I mean, it's a very beautiful thing. And that's why I do it as much as I do. Yeah. Why do you think people are... Um attracted to that entertainment why do you why do you think people like going to see a play why do you think people like going to uh, the movies and seeing uh going to the movie theater and seeing a movie production like Mm -hmm. what's your opinion on that like i think it's um i think it's the routine of it you know i think or maybe not i think it's the 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 thousand sort of different forms that it can take. It can be like a night out with your friends. It can be something that you do by yourself. Like I, I love going to see plays by myself or going to movies by myself. It can be like a communal experience. It can be something very solitary. Um, it can be something that you experience with one other person. Like, yeah, I don't know. Endless experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah going to dinner before sitting down yeah. you know having like you said having a cocktail having a glass of wine yeah. just letting something wash over you mm-hmm. for a little while why do you like acting and why do you think a lot of people like acting why do you think the uh there's so many people that come to LA go to New York and pursue this difficult difficult path that is so uh not in your favor in terms of probability <sighs> for me It's just the only thing I've really ever felt like I know how to do. Yeah. And that I have an access point. Sure. Into doing. Mm-hmm. And it's just the only thing that I really like. Not, I mean, it's love. the only thing that I love in the way that I love it. Okay. You know, um, Ex- I'm, explain I'm not a little bit more like I'm not doing it to 
for for the approval. I'm not doing it because You're not my, doing it for the fame and riches. No, my ego is not in the driver's seat. Sure. My ego is definitely present. Yeah, and I've had to check it on multiple occasions. Uh-huh. But I don't know. I just love telling stories, mm. and like some people do it through visual art, some people do it through dance, some people do it through music. Like this is just what makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. I love taking on the experience of another human being. And reflecting it back to other human beings Mm -hmm. and knowing that if I'm lucky or if my work has value or meaning or even if it doesn't, Mm -hmm. like it'll start conversation um, and maybe change something in the life of somebody else. And then it just keeps this whole like human cycle going. going. It just feels like a... I, and I hate the way that I sound right now, but like I, it just feels like a noble way to live my life. Sure. You know? Yeah. And it's, like it's, it, with the money thing, like money can always be found somewhere. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm not doing it for profit. Yeah. I'm doing it because it feels like it's not money's a waste a va- of my life. Money's a validation, though. Like, yeah. Uh, I guess the lawyer, right? It uh, is, yeah. The lawyer gets paid a good chunk of change. You're like, oh shit, I did my job very well. Mm-hmm. And same thing with an actor or like, I guess like personal training, what I do. Like, mm-hmm. oh, I get like a high rate and I get it from like this big client. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, I'm good at what I do. Yeah. A A-list actor, mm-hmm. they get like, I don't know, million, like $20 million for a movie. Like, oh shit, a lot yeah. of people fucked with it. I'm a good actor. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I don't know if this is the record anymore, but I was reading, I think the highest somebody was ever paid to, like one person was ever paid to do a movie was Julia Roberts was paid like $25 million to do Mona Lisa Smile in 2004. I definitely think it's more than that. It's probably more than that now, that's but still, still when you think though. about it, like $25 million yeah. to do one movie, that's insane. Yeah. And it like wasn't even a good movie, I don't think. I don't think people liked it. Sure. But she's Julia Roberts and mm. probably had high production value or but like I don't know. I don't Do you think um entertainment is just as important as like other jobs, I guess? Because I think it's definitely what people go back to in times of global crisis, you know? Yeah. Like you when the pandemic hit like you turn to netflix and you turn to your favorite album and you yeah. like you you have to have it to yeah. turn to yeah before you can like deal with the reality that's presented to you yeah i guess just objectively like i've met a lot of friends at like ucla there's this one guy who studied uh, i don't like i don't know if it's it's kind of the geography of streets like why do when it, where do i put lights at Mm-hmm. where do I put these roads? Like city planning? City kind planning of? type of deal, right? Yeah. And in my head, that's boring as fuck. But to <laughs> him, it was it was his art. Yeah. He was like, where do I put this light so, so I could, uh, so it's more efficient for everybody to get to yeah. their jobs on time and everything like that. I was yeah. like, yo, that is important. There's creativity in everything. Right? Everything. But it, he was doing it through math and through yeah. engineering. Yeah. And I was like, that's super cool. I've never heard anyone talk about that yeah and i was like that's important but then objectively um i'm sitting at home watching a movie i'm getting a lot of joy it's teaching me some lessons i'm like oh that person who's acting Mm -hmm. that guy's important in a different way Mm -hmm. like two i'm just like what's more important are they is is one more important than the other i don't know yeah you know i think about that a lot are you thinking about like the story of the film versus like the celebrity of the actor no i'm talking about the importance to like me Okay. As like the 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 person experience it. Me driving on the road, uh, experiencing the road plan that this person made. Yeah. Me experiencing this movie that someone's acting and it teaches me a life story that makes me more mentally healthy. Mm-hmm. Like, I was like, those both help me mm-hmm. on a day to day basis. Mm-hmm. Which one's more important? I don't know, but I, I like there's. Every job has a purpose, and every job is to help another human being mm-hmm. in some way. But I think about it a lot. I, I don't know. Yeah. Is one more important than the other? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> What's your view on it, though? Like, uh, like I don't know, someone at a McDonald's drive through giving you a 20-piece McNugget when you're mm-hmm. drunk as fuck at night. Like, that's yeah. a super important job, too. Like, yeah. I'm appreciative of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Everything has its 
everything in its right place yeah you know and also it's valid and it's work and it's service and it's meeting somebody else's needs yeah even if they're drunk as fuck you know everybody is everybody's on the same plane in this world everybody's on equal footing and then we just create those hierarchies ourselves i think it's weird that uh people are treated differently Mm -hmm. on based on like what tier of this perceived hierarchy yeah and um i I don't know if it's gonna i mean that's just how the world's been for it's just like those memes where like it's like i don't know i think i I don't know those i saw this in a meme but it's like you know gen z people will get like absolutely terrible service because the server is completely weeded and Mm -hmm. like has too many other things to do but they'll still tip like 25 percent because they understand versus like somebody from like like a boomer or gen x or something who like one tiny little thing will go wrong and they'll tip like 10 percent or something i think like that's an understanding that we're coming to slowly that yeah. like everybody's it's also, you work don't is know. more and it's more also, valuable. It's also you don't know what you don't know type yeah. of deal. Like yeah. my dad every time I go out, he's like, Hey, can you can you tell me how much to tip? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they don't know. Also, like you have to put in your background. Like we grew up in this scene. We are serving. We know what those people go through. Mm-hmm. Like my I don't know, I don't think my dad's ever had a serving job in his life. He came from the Philippines, like mm-hmm. each dollar is very important Mm -hmm. like he doesn't understand yeah like let alone like i don't understand a lot of things that i don't know either yeah you know Mm -hmm. what do you call it um so how is it uh so you're gay Mm -hmm. right and I haven't had a lot of gay friends like growing up. Mm-hmm. L.A. I have a ton of gay friends. Fresno versus L.A. Baby. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> were you always like uh, open about it growing up? Uh, I mean, it was something that I always knew. It was From not like something. What age? Um, probably like I knew that something was up from around. If I were to like, I don't. It's very. It's very hard to like recall, but or I would say good, I knew yeah. that something was kind of going on yeah. around the time that I was maybe like seven, eight, nine, okay. like when I was first forming like a consciousness around like romance and uh-huh. like that kind of stuff. But I was also like an only child of two people who were divorced uh-huh. And, like, I was having to be one thing for my mom, and I was having to be another thing for my dad. What do you mean by one thing for your mom, one thing for your dad? Well, I don't know. I was just, like, you know, I was my mom's child for, like, a couple days, and then I would go over to my dad's house, and I would be my dad's child, and then I'd go back to my mom's house, and I'd be my mom's child. And I was just, like, I was being whatever they needed me to be. Mm -hmm. And this thing that was coming up for me, this Mm -hmm. burgeoning reality, um... I didn't really have like one solid, concrete, safe place to be able to mm. talk about it or like be myself or whatever. Like it was something that I was always kind of suppressing because I was like, mm. I have to make my mom happy. I have to make my dad happy. Like, yeah, it was just weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it, it's, it's something that I've always, known about myself Mm -hmm. is is sugarland like pretty conservative about that stuff too not really no No? again going back to the it's a weird oasis kind of thing it's like once i decided to actually start coming out to people Mm -hmm. in high school yeah everybody was like okay cool that's awesome yeah that's crazy yeah because uh i I just couldn't imagine it I, i like i tried my best in like every situation to like if I was in their shoes, like, what would I do? Mm-hmm. So, like, I had, I knew for a fact, like, one of my good friends who I did Boy Scouts with, mm-hmm. um, you could clearly tell. He's, like, one of the most flamboyant, like, mm-hmm. gay guys I know, but he's one of my good friends, too. Mm-hmm. And I I think he came out just maybe a year ago. So, like, yeah. 23, 24, something yeah. like that. And you're, and I just couldn't imagine coming out to like a super conservative family mm-hmm. that like thinks it's like you're gonna go to hell and it's yeah I, I just couldn't imagine i just wanted to know your experience because like i know these guys well, who like like more often than not 
like one one thing that I've learned through this process of you know coming out and mm-hmm. dealing with you know have even the fact that you have to do that still and even the Some fact that that's the world, like it's not it's not too common anymore but like it but the like, fact that that's been a barrier yeah I think is kind of going away, which yeah. is amazing. But, but still, dude, there's some countries if you go, like you'll you'll get killed. Yeah, of course, it's still there. Yeah, yeah. and we live in L.A., mm-hmm. West Hollywood. It's super accepted. It's awesome. Like, yeah. you could be whoever the fuck you are, yeah. gay, straight, he, she, they, whatever. Yeah. awesome. But there's still a place mm-hmm. you go, you fly, mm-hmm. and they find out they're gonna execute you. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, I back on sort of like the micro scale like even just coming out like it's not always like a a conservative religious kind of Mm -hmm. thing that you're met with pushback like for example like my dad Mm -hmm. my dad and i have a great relationship we he's he's come a very long way Mm -hmm. he had a hard time Mm -hmm. when i came out to him but he's from chicago he's a very he's like a bleeding heart liberal yeah He's a lawyer. He's like he's a family attorney. Like mm-hmm. he's he's a person like of the people and he has been very like liberal and democratic and everything that you think a quote unquote like supportive parent would be in that situation sure. his whole life. And he was the one that had a hard time with it. Mm-hmm. And my mom and my stepdad and my stepmom, all people who have been born and bred in Texas, yeah. who like are very religious, like they were totally chill when I came out to them. That's ironic. So for me, it was backwards. Yeah, that's it was totally like backwards. if you look at it on a superficial level, the one that I should have gotten the most support from, I didn't get any support <laughs> from at all at the beginning. Yeah, but it's it's different for everybody. Yeah, you know, like with my dad, it was an issue of like this negates like everything that I've tried to to instill upon my child, and it feels like a stab in the back, and he's choosing like a life of hardship and it like went back to like his experience with his parents sure. and like it's, it's I could just, totally see that. that. That That's relatable to me. Yeah. Like, but he's been, I mean, like I had to come out to him a couple times because yeah. it was, it was very, very hard for him in the beginning, but yeah. he proved that it was important. I mean, the most important thing in his life was for him to have a relationship with his child at all costs. And so once he knew that it was something that was out of his control, yeah. he signed up to start going to P flag meetings. P flag yeah. is a group called parents and friends of lesbians and gays. Sure. It's basically just like a support group for people who have gay lesbian LGBT identifying family members mm-hmm. who sometimes don't know how to process the nuances yeah. of their relationship with that person. He started going to meetings consistently for years and that's he's been to Pride day. like awesome, three, bro. four different times, wow. and I, I've, I've been to Pride like maybe once. Like I've never. I went, I went once. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it is. It is insane. Yeah, it's... <laughs> out here, yeah, of course. It's, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole different thing out here. But it's like wild. he went, he's been to Houston Pride. Yeah. Okay. And like leaps and bounds. That's you know? awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. He visited this summer and he met my boyfriend and like That's so cool. I just uh I, I just wanted to ask you because like um uh, I my cousin mm-hmm. had a wedding. Mm-hmm. He's gay, had a kid mm-hmm. and one of my grandparents didn't go because he's super religious, right? Mm-hmm. I have another friend here, his brother is gay and his parents won't meet him and his partner for a dinner. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just like, yo, that sucks. That's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah. But, and I was just like wondering your experience with it. It sounds your, yours is way better than all of those. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been a journey. Yeah, sure. You know, it's like, like I hardship. first, the first time I came out to a family member was when I came out to my mom, which was my senior year of high school. So I was 17. Came really? out to my dad about So six, that's kind of late too. I mean, you said you felt it at seven or eight though. Yeah. And then I went through my whole adolescence Mm -hmm. of like, how do I, how do I deal with this? Sure. You know, um, I guess in terms of like identifying it versus actually stating it as a reality, a lot of time has have passed, but like people wait longer, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I came out to my mom when I was 17, came out to my dad probably like six months later. Um, 
It's always the mom first. <laughs> yeah, just because you know, I, don't, I don't know. That's a, it's a weird thing, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It was like the first couple of years were sort of like, how do I handle this? How do I talk yeah. about this? And I finally started to feel comfortable. I think just having it be a normal not anything with any stigma around it part of my life when sure. I entered into this relationship yeah because it was just like because this is this relationship that I'm, I'm currently in is my first relationship yeah and I live with him oh, really and yeah yeah That's first awful. like this is a you know yeah. first romantic relationship yeah um and I think it goes this whole thing that we're talking about it goes back to like similar to uh, your acting it's just who I am it's what I do mm-hmm this it is doesn't have to be anything I am, more than what that. I do. No, yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. What do you call it? So you recently started working out with me. Yes. A few months ago. Mm -hmm. How many pounds have you lost now? <sighs> I don't know. I still haven't bought a scale. <laughs> don't get decent mad at amount me. though, right? But yeah, about about nine, I would say. Okay. Yeah, I and went then, from one seventy six to one sixty seven. And then uh, you're getting a lot of uh, validations. Your arms looking big and stuff mm -hmm. at concerts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But besides, I guess the looks mm -hmm. and the pounds. Mm -hmm. um, what has working out and I uh, just using your body like how does it how's it made you feel the last few months yeah so like mentally physically mm -hmm. just give me a rundown of your personal experience it's weird like taking into account the aesthetics of working out mm -hmm. when you're a gay man in LA yeah. because like body types are sort of like scrutinized and sort of objectified a lot more than they would be in other parts of the country really so that's kind of in like my fitness journey. It's sort of been sometimes what has held me back because I've always been like an active person mm -hmm. and I've always like, you know, fitness and like the cycle of being really consistent and of working out versus sure. like just not doing anything for months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, it's always been present, but like in LA, it's like if you're, if you're a gay man in your early twenties and you're going out and you're, like having a good time, you want to look good, and sometimes when you I feel think like, that you I don't, don't, I don't necessarily think it's a, uh, a gay man. I feel like it's. I feel like it's everybody. Yeah, yeah everybody. Of course, <laughs> I feel of like course. girl, guy, yeah. whoever. You just want to look good. That's fair. You're, yeah, that's fair. Um, but when you're not getting those results fast enough, mm -hmm. you kind of tend to just abandon it because mm -hmm. you're like, whatever. This is just how I look. Like, I'll attract whoever I attract, but I don't. I don't want to put any more into any more effort into this than okay. I already yeah. do. Um. But just like keeping it like a regular part of my week mm -hmm. and building strength. Yeah. Like what you've talked about, like the difference between what we're doing versus something like berries. Yeah. You know, it's it's not just sculpting. Mm -hmm. It's actually making your body more functional and able to carry the weight of your daily routine with more ease so that yeah. everything else just kind of like falls into place. That's something that I've really learned and really appreciated. Mm -hmm. And it's why I want to keep going with it because sure. it's just about, you know, it's about longevity. Yeah. It's about living your fullest and longest life mm -hmm. as opposed to just looking really good for yeah. a certain period of time. And it kind of goes hand in hand though. Like, uh, the, the more that you focus on longevity, your body working, it will do it. Like, it's just, if you focus on that aspect, you're going to get, the the physicality too mm -hmm. you know yeah but in terms of like ha have you had any like change in like just your energy during the day or uh your uh mental health all that stuff yeah definitely in what ways um i'm i'm a lot more open to embrace this new like creativity is everywhere abundance is everywhere mentality mm -hmm. that I'm trying to lead with in yeah. my life. Um, it's not, it's not like, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's, it's everything is not as product driven as it once was, yeah. you know, like I'm, if I'm working on my body consistently mm -hmm. because I want to, and because it makes me feel good mm -hmm. rather than I'm doing it because I want to look, look a certain it. way. Yeah that's product oriented, yeah. you know, and it's everything that I'm trying to avoid. So it's a really good, literally like very, very healthy mirror into the way that I'm trying to approach my craft and the way that I'm trying to ap approach my life. Mm -hmm. Like it's just about taking it one day at a time yeah. and, and feeding yourself with healthy things mm -hmm. and giving yourself experiences that 
you'll enjoy without attaching like any sort of external reward to yeah. them. I love them, man. Yeah. I'm happy for you. Yeah. You're killing it. Yeah. <laughs> what do you call it? Um, I've been super, I'm super into the body. I'm curious about like the body positivity movement, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And, uh, because I get the whole body positivity friends. I have friends who are like plus models mm-hmm. and they embrace, I, I love seeing, cause I, I face this sometimes too. Sometimes I don't like taking just like pictures cause like I don't know how to pose or right. like, I just don't know how much, like I'm a very stiff guy. I work out a lot. Right? <laughs> I, I don't know how to like, especially I, my girlfriend's a dancer. They right. move very beautifully. Yeah. They, the, these body positions that they put, I was just very graceful. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll pose for a picture. I was like, that doesn't look pretty. That looks stiff as fuck. Right. Yeah. And I will see like a very, uh, a plus size model or whatever, mm-hmm. super confident rocking it. Yeah. I get it. Mm-hmm. But they, they preach these, uh, body positivity things and all that stuff, but scientifically or like health wise, they like talk down about working out sometimes or like mm-hmm. losing weight. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm at a spot where. I don't know which way to go. Like I get both sides. Well, I think what they're referring to is working out in order to look a certain way. Like, I think like, yeah, working out to achieve a six pack or working out to achieve like defined muscles Mm -hmm. or working out to like lose weight Mm -hmm. and like expressly to lose weight. Yeah. Like is kind of what I, and you know, I don't want to speak for any of these people, but like i think that's sort of what the root of the movement is about Mm -hmm. in that like if you're healthy and you have the body that you have and you feel confident Mm -hmm. but isn't objectively like at a certain body weight or body fat percentage like it's not healthy that's where i that's where i like i think that's the line where i'm sure i mean maybe you know if you are morbidly obese, like thousand pound sisters on TLC or whatever, and you're just wallowing in it and not doing anything about it and having it affect your mentality to the point where you intentionally damage the relationships Mm -hmm. surrounding you that keep you supported. Yeah. Then like, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's unhealthy. Yeah. Um, but you know, as far as, everything else and as far as like all the other things being in place in your life sure then it, yeah i don't know yeah i was just curious on your thoughts on that yeah it's just like i think if you have yeah. a very healthy life and you find yourself attractive mm-hmm. and you have incredible relationships and you have an incredible support system and you have a passion and you have drive and maybe you have a six-pack maybe you don't yeah. maybe you like i don't know maybe you're sculpted yeah. maybe you're not maybe you're a certain height maybe you're a certain whatever yeah like i just think if everything else is in place in your life you're all set yeah good to go yeah if you're comfortable in your own skin and mm-hmm. just like yeah. doing all the things that you want to do and need to do yeah yeah do you have any um goals acting goals i guess like <laughs> like for some people i guess some of my act other acting friends it's like season regulars or mm-hmm. um a-list actor or a certain amount of money to break out like i don't know what's 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 ryan brophy's uh do you have like an end goal like or are you just enjoying every moment as it goes like yeah that (laughs) i really just want to work and keep keep doing things and keep being inspired all of that other stuff is so unpredictable (laughs) Like, truly. I mean, if you don't accept that in this profession, then you're fucked, you know? Sure. Like, there are so many factors at play all at once Mm -hmm. at any given time. And if you're blessed with a passion for storytelling, you really just have to focus on that and you really just have to cultivate that. And I want to work on stage. I want to work on camera. I want to keep doing voiceover. Like I sexy talk, sexy talk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Inside joke guys. Inside joke. Yes. No more period. Full stop. Leave it to your imagination. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I want to keep telling stories and sure, sure if I, if I'm, fortunate enough to 
have something that takes off and make a lot of money from that that would be amazing cool but if not cool if i as i said earlier like money can always be found somewhere yeah and that's why i work in hospitality is because yeah. it's easy to make money and you treat it like you you treat it like acting yeah exactly i find value is. in it yeah yeah there's value in everything if you really put yeah put your mind to it i, I love wine i, I want to take wine classes like becoming a sommelier is very creative like you can build you a wine take tier program one with me? sure let's yeah. do it let's I, talk i always want to i have these wine books like i'm super interested in it yeah and that's one thing that i love about hospitality too like uh I, this even this bitters company mm-hmm. our slogan is spark your spirits right? yeah spirits meaning like your actual yeah human spirits lively spirits and actual mm-hmm. your your drink your spirits yeah. and it's it's been around for so long alcohol has been around for so long yeah and um what has alcohol done for people in a positive light obviously there's the negative aspect to yeah. it uh too much of anything's bad yeah but um we're enjoying this cocktail right now yeah uh we're enjoying this whiskey and we're having yeah. a great conversation yeah it's a, relaxing our body mm-hmm. to like just enjoy each other's company and whatever and that's what hospitality is too you have a glass of wine you enjoy the experience yeah. it's from bordeaux you yeah. hear the story about it the server presents this label yeah. the date year the it's re- decanted yeah. yeah oh my goodness it's so bougie it's the theater of it <laughs> yeah. it is yeah, yeah. tell them a story yeah tell totally story. letting it open and yeah. having a cocktail while the wine opens do you have any hobbies besides like acting oh gosh um you said video games kind of kind of like Not barely really. like one video game that i play over and over and over again um i don't know man i reading i read a lot yeah um, what has reading done for you because like i just got into re- reading probably like five years ago and it's changed my life yeah i mean i'm in a self-help phase for sure i mean i definitely enjoy fiction yeah um but i'm not as sort of like up to trends with the market of fiction as I probably should be. Yeah. Um, but it's meditative, yeah. you know, like having a book in my hands and like turning pages and absorbing whatever is in the pages is, is really nice. Yeah. Um, I've done, a, you know, yoga. I've done a lot in the past. I haven't done it as much recently just because I've been focusing on what we've been doing. And yeah. um, it could be a good component, but I just feel like I don't have yeah. room. I think, I think, um, I did hot yoga for a little bit. And I love it. I love hot yoga. Um, especially with what we're doing right now, like mm-hmm. a ton of strength training, it's going to be a great complimentary mm-hmm. to it. If you can do it like one day a week, just yeah. because you're going to stiffen up. Yeah. But the breathing part of yoga helped me a lot yeah. because I sometimes meditate. Yeah. But focusing on your breath for that long, your body not doing anything. Right. It's kind of hard sometimes. Of course. But, like, if you have movements to go with it, all yeah. that stuff, it's a lot easier. Mm-hmm. Like, that hour goes by versus me sitting on my patio across my legs and right. breathing in and breathing yeah. out and right. breathing in and breathing <laughs> out and be like, fuck, it's been one minute. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, I guess I, I scuba dive. Have I ever told you that? No. Yeah. But it's also, like, scuba diving is so conducive with travel which i'm so like unable to can you not scuba dive in la you can like you can go out to like catalina Mm -hmm. um but the water's so cold that usually you have to have like a dry suit certification yeah which is like a different thing that i don't have but i got certified when i was 11 oh shit yeah i've been to aruba i've been to the great barrier reef i've done like the keys that's awesome um yeah I was just asking because, like, I feel like hobbies, like, get, how you do anything, so you do everything, right? Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. And, like, I'm just so curious about, like, there's so many things to do in this lifetime, you know? Uh-huh. Like, I picked up surfing over, uh, like, COVID. Yeah. I read all the Harry Potter books, read all the Fifty For the Shades first time? Read, for the first time. Wow. Over COVID. I read... I think over 40 books wow 20, 2020 yeah i've only picked up in 2021 i think i read seven yeah like but <laughs> um not a lot mm-hmm. but for me well all these guitars and stuff like do you play yeah okay but very, see i can't i cannot practice i fucking hate practicing yeah. very amateur though the thing is like uh i'm i'm compelled i'm i'm decent at a lot of things yeah right? and i'm not I don't think I'm great at... Do you want to be great, though? 
I don't know. I think so. I feel, I mean, that's what these self-help books tell you. That you should be great? That you should be really good at one thing at least. Huh. To, at least, I had a self-help phase, right? Uh, <laughs> books changed my life. Yeah. I was super depressed at one point. And the girl broke up with me. I mm-hmm. uh, was super depressed. Like, yeah. had like one minor, 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 like probably 10 second thought of like suicide. Yeah. But... 10 second thoughts, a a very long thing when you're thinking about it. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I'm the happiest I've ever been. My right now, like, uh, Mm -hmm. peace of mind, very confident what I do, Mm -hmm. whatever. These self books, help books changed my life. Yeah. But I don't know, maybe, maybe being decent at everything is good. But like from what I've gotten, it's like, you have to focus on one thing, get really, really, really good at putting in your 10,000 hours Mm -hmm. and boom, bang. There you go. That's your that's your success. Yeah, but uh, everyone has their own different route. I don't know. So what is that for you right now? For me, fitness. uh, No, no. So fitness brings me a lot of joy because um, I love helping people. Yeah. And I didn't in a way. So one of my first, I think my fifth client, he was three hundred and fifty pounds, big boy, Mm -hmm. six six Mm -hmm. around that. He lost like 30 pounds with me in like a few months. Yeah. He's like, dude, I could walk up the stairs okay without my knee hurting. I could carry my kid. Mm-hmm. Boom. Yeah. This girl, she's a lawyer at uh, UCLA. She's like, oh, I have dudes looking at me at, at looking at me at the beach. I I got asked out like three times. Mm-hmm. Like, dope. That's yeah. awesome. Um, yeah. So like, honestly, if it was up to me. And I took out that aspect of personal training. I would just train for myself because uh, I I just like working out, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And honest, I could potentially use my time elsewhere mm-hmm. in pursuing bitters full time and like putting my ten thousand hours in that. Mm-hmm. But I like helping people and seeing them progress makes me happy because yeah. I went through that spot too. I lost thirty pounds. Like when I was 19, I got, it made me feel better, not necessarily look wise, look wise as well. Yeah. That was a result, but I felt stronger. My energy was good yeah. all day. The looks are a bonus. They're a bonus. They're a perk. They're a perk. hundred mm-hmm. percent. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. That was a good question. Um, I don't know if uh, focusing on one thing yeah. in your entire life is, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you, do you uh, feel like acting is that one thing? <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, I just, I like, I, I don't know. I, like 10,000 hours to become like a perfectionist. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. But like, I just know yeah. that it's the thing that I have literally since age five mm-hmm. been called to do. Yeah. And it's weird how I things... haven't been able to shake it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's weird how things happen, though. Like, do you know Matthew McConaughey's story? I read his book. Yeah. Really good book. Yeah. Great memoir. But yeah. Yo, he was in a bar, basically. This dude asked here, hey, yeah. would you like to come in for a script? Boom, I'm an actor. Yeah. Period. <laughs> well, and the thing that I did like about it, though, is that, like, he, he qualifies it in the book. He's like, now, this is usually the part where, like, the actor gets to L.A. Like, he has to slog through, like, five years of, yeah. like, menial jobs before, like, he gets, like, any guest star in a series. This is not my story. Yeah. And I do, in a weird, twisted way, like, part of me wants to be like, well, fuck you, Matthew McConaughey. Like, yeah. whatever. Like, <laughs> That's the, you had this otherworldly like once in a lifetime experience. So yeah. how can I relate to this? But also part of me is like, okay, you acknowledge that your experience is outside the norm. Yeah, but yours is different too. You went to uh, USC to get you into these spots versus like this small hometown girl coming to LA doesn't know what the fuck she's doing. Yeah, she has no connections at all. So sure, yours is I was too. fortunate, but also like. Who's to say that her journey is any less valid than mine is? Or if Matthew McConaughey's is any less valued than yours. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. It is what it is. If you want to live your life in a noble way and you want to be creative, yeah. no matter what background you come from, like, you have the right to do that. Yeah. And it, we only, like, we're literally on the planet for such a short amount of time yeah. that, like... Do you do think about it? that a lot? I think about that I've a lot. I've started to. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've definitely started to. Yeah. I'm like 25 and I'm like, "Oh, Jesus." I'm like Some days I'm like, "Oh shit." Like TikTok. But yeah. I mean, it's also long too. Uh I I I think the the mortality part, 
uh, kicks me into gear about like sometimes like oh you you have to start doing shit yeah because you want to know a weird twisted thing that I do what I'll go on some like if I watch something and I'm like enthralled by an actor's performance or something like on a movie or a play. on a movie or a play or yeah. whatever I'll like go on their Wikipedia page and I'll look at the years active section mm-hmm. and I'll look at the start date. And then I'll, like, compute their age, and I'll be like, oh, so they were, like, 21 when they started. Yeah. Or they were 15. Yeah. Or they were, oh, they were 30. Mm-hmm. Or they were 35. But then I will always compare it back to, like, myself. Mm-hmm. And the horrible, toxic thing is that I'll be like, what's the start date going to be on my Wikipedia page whenever I have That's one? That's so toxic. Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. But, like, it's a habit. And I think it's a habit that... I, number one, am shaking, thankfully. I mean, I'm not, like, clear of it by any means. But, yeah, yeah, I think it's something that, like, it's one thing that I'll say about being in a big city like this, like L.A. or New York. It's something that it kind of breeds. Comparison. You feel like you're on a timeline. Yeah. You know? Also, like, you see, like, the Lamborghinis and shit on, like, Instagram or the girls with, like, on a yachts and everything like that yeah or whatever it just this city is hard to i mean some is portrayed so lavishly when mm-hmm. i think it's one of the, the hardest cities to just live in in yeah. terms of like yo my rent is more than my parents mortgage yeah or like <laughs> that, i was like that shit's hard yeah yo like on my days off, I'm I'm grinding, you yeah. know, like mm-hmm. it's a grind out here. Like, yeah. I sometimes I appreciate it. Sometimes I I want to be um, my married friend in Fresno, California, with uh, the one kid and three dogs, and yeah. the backyard with a vegetable garden. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I I'm like, dang, what if? Yeah, you know. Mm-hmm. Do you think you're gonna stay, stay in LA long? Dude, I mean, New York has always kind of been my, like, quote-unquote next step. Yeah. For acting, it's basically LA or New York, correct? If you want to make a career out of it, yes. that's what they tell you, yeah. I mean, is if that, you, I mean, is that accurate, though, not just what they tell you? Well, I mean, if you want to be, like, a regional theater actor in Seattle or in, like the mid like milwaukee or no what is it minneapolis has the guthrie and okay. that's like a really notable th- chicago is a huge theater town like you can make a living in those places it probably won't be like a crazy living mm-hmm. but theoretically yeah if you want to be surrounded by the energy of i want this to be like i i want to get like a lot of money out of this and a lot of money, opportunity yeah. yeah it's generally la or new york okay but you know it's it's happening everywhere you know like seattle chicago atlanta uh atlanta's big for like dance too uh, yeah from what yeah I've heard. um london i almost went to grad school in london i would love to live overseas one day oh, shit. i did study abroad there for four months and it was how was that it's my favorite city in the world london yeah how, how why you why would you say it's your favorite city if you only been there for four months just because like theater is like subsidized and it's like such a part of people's daily routine and it's something that everybody's like in touch with and knows about like it's going on and it has the sprawl of LA but it has the public transportation of New York and like it'll be super nice during the summer but then it'll be really cold and it'll be rainy and it just has like I don't I don't know it's just like it's so vibrant like mm. there's so many things that happen in that city and it's just amazing i miss it so much like i i'm i look a forward i want to go i want to go now you've never been <laughs> no dude i like <laughs> i'm overdue for new york i haven't been in new york since february 2019 but i'm like That's super <laughs> it's not that long it's three years though and i usually i try and go like once, once a year, a year. Yeah. but with london the last time i went was 2018 yeah. and i'm like when is gonna be the next time yeah I haven't. I don't think I've experienced New York to. I guess like its fullest potential. I think you got to live there to really experience yeah. it. I've been there for like a week or like a few days, mm-hmm. but for me, it just feels like a concrete jungle, man. Mm-hmm. Like everything's. I I feel like the hustle of New York is different than the hustle of LA. I love hustle. 
and bustle in yeah. whatever form it takes. Like if it's spread out like it is out here or yeah. if it's like jam packed the way yeah. it is in New York, I, I don't, I'm adaptable, Yeah. which I think is valuable yeah. for what I want to do. I don't know. Do you think, uh, do you think that mentality is like good or bad? No, I, I, well, I mean, I think it's good in that, like if a job takes me to New York or, yeah. and I do that job and then another job takes me back to LA, uh -huh. like I, I'll be happy on, it's like, I, I could be by, by coastal. I have friends that are already by coastal. Um, and like they're from LA, so they have like yeah. family that they can stay with and stuff. So it's like kind of different, but like, yeah, I, I could truly, I could toggle back and forth and mm. be just as happy that's or I could one go thing overseas I, or I could go to Canada or I could go wherever. That's and, one thing I love about, I guess it could be a multiple jobs, but especially actors, mm -hmm. they'll film all over the place, right? Yeah. It could be New York, California, Atlanta. It could be in the fucking Midwest or like whatever. They mm -hmm. get to travel a lot and get to explore. Like my goal for like the bitters company is like, Oh, it takes off and bartend in london for a little bit learn about their yeah. culture bartend in japan learn about sake yeah well, like bar bartend in mexico and make like the best margaritas on the beach bartend in hawaii learn tiki drinks yeah you know so um i guess that's my form of like acting or like learning about cultures and stuff because i feel like being an actor too like you get to experience different cultures from all the places you get to travel yeah. for yeah. jobs mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of jobs keep you in one spot for a long time. Like if you're a lawyer, you're working up in um, a firm, you're going to stay there for fucking 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, your yeah. whole fucking entire life. You know, yeah. you're going to experience it. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I don't want to regret. Yeah. Like staying in one space. My dad was long. working when I was born. My dad was working for a firm in Corpus Christi. So I was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. And then when I was about a year and a half or two or something, he and my mom decided to relocate and he started his own firm in houston oh fuck yeah so yeah but i mean yeah he's been in houston ever since yeah but there there's something cool about that in the sense that he built his own business all this mm -hmm. stuff but he's not experiencing a lot of life that mean, <laughs> i mean maybe he's content with it cool. yeah he probably is yeah but i don't know i feel like i feel like there's so much life to experience that if uh, you're in like a creative profession like this yeah the potential for it is definitely very tantalizing yeah yeah what's your definition of like a creative lifestyle <sighs> uh tapping into like source energy i guess of the universe and just following your gut and whatever it is that makes you feel happy and whatever makes you feel like you're putting something out into the world and receiving something back yeah well, that's pretty good yeah i think we'll end it there my friend okay <laughs> thanks for coming bro thank you sir. appreciate it I everybody it. uh mr ryan brophy mm -hmm. that's me peace peace